Hi, everyone. Welcome again for our next conversation about the Stewardship Well Done journey. I'm Brett Heinzman from Free Methodist Communications. And once again, we're welcoming Caitlin Koppelman, Chris DeBacker, Carol Dubrowski, and Scott Blakemore for our conversation about saving today. Now, the Stewardship Well Done journey, guys, has other types of saving in it. So like, for instance, we've just a couple steps ago talked about emergency fund, and we've talked about saving for retirement. Now, those are very specific kinds of saving, but this this step just says save. So help help our people understand like what are we talking about when we talk about saving in general and how does this differ from the emergency fund or saving for retirement? Well, I, I think for each person, savings is is very different. You know, I think if if we were just to poll a hundred people on what are you what are you saving for, I think you're gonna get a hundred different answers because savings is really tied or should be tied to your goals. So we go back to that step. And so each person's goals are so unique and so different. Their incomes and the resources that they have available are so different. So each person's savings plan is gonna just, just be a little bit different. It's gonna be unique to them. And I think that's important too, because you're not following a just a cookie cutter type plan that really doesn't mean much to you. You know, you can follow rules of thumb and know that I should be saving so much for something. Some people don't know why they're saving just because they were told. I think it's much more meaningful and much easier when, when times get tough and you have a choice of spending money on this or this, spending money or um, saving money. If you know it's tied to your specific goal, you're gonna be much more apt to continue that savings plan. So I think, um, I think, if you tie that to your goals and keep that in mind, it's going to be much easier to go down that, that road. Is it safe to say then, Chris, that without goals, many people may not save because they really don't, they don't really have anything attached to that or, or their goals, like their goals maybe are, are like misaligned or they're not really great goals. And so their saving somehow gets off track because of that. Yeah, I, I think it's because they don't have goals. You know, their goal is just to make it to the end of the month. So if you're if you're just needing enough money to make the car payment, to make the, the rent payment, and to make the whatever other payment, that, that's all we need to do. So I really don't, I don't see a reason to save because if I can just get by month to month, I'm fine with that. I've had the opposite to where I've had a client who just saved, 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 saved. And, um, and I was really shocked of how much money she had in her checking account, let alone her savings account. And nothing was invested. She wasn't generous um, at giving. So, so, and again, you know, it, it can be the opposite of not just living, you know, paycheck to paycheck, but, but, loving and almost um, that adrenaline of watching those numbers increase, but not living with open hands. So it ties into goals. Like, why are you doing what you're doing? And what, what do you think God wants you to do um, with your extra, you know, that he gives you? So Carol, you're saying basically that the, the lack of a goal produced a situation where there was accumulation with no outlet. That's right. That's right. So I think Interesting. step one, that step one, um, going back to your priorities is, is critical. Yeah. I would add to that to say that uh, I've had similar conversations with people where they accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. And I say, why are you doing that? Not in, not in a convicting, not in a condemning way, but like, for what purpose? Are you doing that? But especially if I identify in the conversation that they want to be generous or they feel like they don't have enough or they their perception is they're just scraping by or they want to give more to their kids and then they pull out their checking account statement. And I'm like, I, I just have questions because, because you are hoarding your finances and and it's not, I, I, I don't see an outlet for that. And, and that I, I think that can reveal a heart issue. Um, where it becomes, I'm afraid I'm not going to have enough. 
which is, you would think that the root of that is fear and that's a part of it, but the deepest down part is I don't trust that God's going to provide for every need along the way. And maybe the Lord has provided now for needs that you'll have in the future. So yes, you should, you should save that money. You should maintain a cash balance of some amount for some future goal or potential need, but uh, you, you could be hoarding money and that's really a symptom of a lack of trust in the father, which is not freedom. You might think that you're free because you have hordes of money, but you're not really free. And, and I think some people don't know too how much they need. They really have no idea. You know, they hear, maybe they read something online or they hear some news report that says, you know, the cost of, we'll just use this example, the cost of long-term care is just skyrocketing and medical costs and prescription costs are just going through the roof. And without having a plan in place, I think people may just say, well, I need to save this because I don't know what's going to happen. I, I, I really don't know. But if you can show them a plan and show them this is how much you would need in retirement, let's say, I think it does then free a person up to be able to, to be able to give. If they know they have saved enough, I think then it does free them up to be able to do other things, give to ministry, give to children now. And, uh, but I think it's going back and following that plan and having someone show them that you have, you've saved enough, you've done it, you've, you've, you've made it. And from everything we can see, you've, you've got things pretty well taken care of. So it frees them up to do other things and live that life of generosity. Like we had talked about in the past. That's another object of permission. We've talked about that in other conversations, like giving people permission. So to be able to say from our evaluation, you now have enough. And in fact, maybe we could invest this in a smarter way instead of it sitting in your checking account or a local bank savings account. Let's actually put it to greater work so that you can even be more generous and know you're taken care of. You know, so if the if the nagging question is, do I have enough in case of a life event, the you can help bring that answer about like yes or no, or here's what else has to change. Or if we flip this switch, it actually frees you up. Those are great things. I would add just one other thing related to the savings and not knowing why they're doing it or how much they need to save is that I, we often run into people who are maybe saving for a short-term purchase and yet they want to put it in the stock market, you know, for a need that's maybe a year and a half or two years out. But then for retirement, they, they might be wanting to put it in CDs because they need to have it protected for when they retire. And so just understanding the appropriateness of an investment for the desired goal and timeline is just an important part of, of that. And so, you know, understanding what it's for, when you're going to need it, you know, what's appropriate and how best to allocate those resources. It's just part of the way we come alongside people and help educate them, hold their hand, answer questions then they can make the wisest decisions. Yes, Scott, I think that that touches on why this step is different than other points of saving along the journey. The other points that we brought up savings are like the emergency fund or making sure that you have a savings line in your budget to replenish your emergency fund or uh, like retirement, making initial contributions to a plan uh, that might be provided through your employer. But this is like, those are foundational steps and this is like half a step beyond that to say, okay, now I've got these other things in place and I'm going to do this. And when you move to the and, that's when you begin to need to be a lot more intentional about how you make your allocation choices and, and what your time frame might be for those goals, which or for those, for those funds, which your priorities and your goals inform that. One of the things I'd like us to, to talk about for a moment has to do actually with some spiritual disciplines in our roots. So the Free Methodist Church is in the Wesleyan tradition. And one thing that amazed me when I learned uh, initially about John Wesley and some of the ways he taught the, the original Methodists in England was, he, and I'm paraphrasing here, but basically his encouragement was to, to work hard and earn a lot and save a lot. But then there's the PS, the why. The why was so, and he quotes scripture, you can be generous on every occasion. And it was all about ministry to the poor. So maybe help, we're talking, you guys are Christian financial counselors, which means that we're looking at money through a Christian worldview. So it's not saving for us. It's not saving so we have a bigger bank account. In the end, it's how have you seen this dynamic of work hard, earn a lot, save a lot, so that you can be generous on every occasion 
save is right in that discipline. Have you seen this at work or what might you add to this conversation about this thing that's kind of built into our Wesleyan DNA? Well, I just recently, Brett, had a client whose husband passed away and they lived, um, they lived a life of um, kind of scarcity, you know, that just, just, they, they tithed to their church, but it was just a minimum tithe based on social security um, and maybe their RMD from some of their investments. And, um, but after he passed away and I sat down with this individual and went through, which by the way, she had no idea of all her investments that her husband was doing. Um, she realized that she was actually a millionaire. Okay. And when I put it that way, you know, the tears came and we started unpacking exactly that living a life of generosity. It's like, why do you, why do you have all of this? You know, you're 80, you know, give it away now, you know, yes, it's great to leave an inheritance to your kids, to your grandkids, but there's plenty there. And, um, and so she, she changed everything. And just watching her um, has been so exciting of how she set up a charitable gift fund and she's leaving money to uh, a seminary for new pastors. And she's just taking that money and dispersing it, um, which, you know, was kind of sad that her spouse didn't get to see that, mm -hmm. you know, so it was really exciting to watch that turn of you know, her realizing what she's has and, and now being able to um, give more than what she ever imagined. So that was really exciting that that part of the journey to walk through with her. I think that's a place where um, maybe we're all Americans on the screen here, but American culture and kingdom culture are not the same. So American culture is earn money, save money, you know, keep it for yourself, hoard up your mountains of money, you know, and, and the Lord says, don't put your treasure where moth and rust destroy, right? Put your treasure in heaven. And one of the ways that we build treasure in heaven is by that generosity gene, but that's not, that's not a part of how Americans think. And that's an overgeneralization, but kingdom people think in a way of generosity and like, Carol's client, she didn't mean to not think kingdom. She, she thought they thought that they were all mm -hmm. along the way. And then all of a sudden this other uh, piece comes to light and they thought, oh my gosh, I thought I understood generosity, but I didn't all the way. There's another, there's another fold of the kingdom version of generosity that I can implement now when I didn't even realize that I could. So that, that culture misalignment can be challenging for people to walk through. I would say that even in myself as a financial advisor, I want to do all the right steps and I want to practice what I preach, et cetera. One of the things I think God has been challenging me is, you know, at times we can get into this mindset, I'll be generous when I have everything taken care of and it's all, I, I get to that place. Well, there's no guarantee I'm ever going to get to that place. And so what I think God has been challenging me is be generous along the way. You learn to be generous. It's like a muscle. You know, it's like forgiveness is a muscle too. Mm. you practice generosity. You, you, and it can be in little amounts, you know, it can be, I mean, I have one fun thing that I just like to do and I'm, I'm not saying, you know, bragging about it, but it's like when I'm at a restaurant, whether I'm traveling or just by myself and I see what I presume to be a widow, I, I buy her meal. I mean, that's just something I enjoy doing. It's a little act of generosity, but it keeps that muscle moving to say, Scott, you don't own all this. You know, I want you to, to help this person uh, and, and buy them a meal. It may be just a small act, but you know what? They may be praying for some sign that God is with them and cares about them. And so I just try to be obedient in those leadings, but you don't, you don't have to get there to start practicing generosity. Uh, you can save, you can pay down your debt, you can do your retirement planning. You can do all of it. Uh, take care of those you, you, you care about and that you love, but your priorities are, you know, they're all, um, being met. You're, 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 you're hitting on all cylinders trying to take care of those things. And at the same time, you should be practicing generosity. 
um, you know, forgiveness and generosity. I kind of feel like those are the things Jesus was about. And, you know, and so we can learn to practice that muscle along the way. Great points. Well, this has been a great conversation about saving. I'm sure there'd be much more to talk about. And especially as we encourage people to contact you to begin the conversation, it'll be to begin their conversation about their own issues with saving, whether it's the save or spender thing in their household or how and when do I save and how much and am I hoarding up without purpose or how do I you know, set my sales in the right direction? Folks like Caitlin and Chris and Scott and Carol are ready to have that conversation with you. So thanks so much for this conversation on saving. Be sure to visit fmffinancial.org slash stewardship for all the steps of the Stewardship Well Done journey.